Hi, this is Abhishek Agarwal. Today we are going to talk about cyber security and today's topic is cyber warfare, cyber war and sanctions. So what is sanctions? Sanctions are the threat and penalty for disobeying the laws created by certain organizations or specific countries. These are the international laws. So when this kind of any incident happens, the countries or the group of countries put the sanctions. So what kind of sanctions usually we have seen? So one is the SWIFT ban. Uh, SWIFT ban is nothing, just stopping the payment system, cross-border payment system. So the country cannot do the payment outside the country. The MasterCard, Visa and Apple Pay, uh, Samsung Pay ban. So these kind of bans will create the problem for the country because the your liquidity which is coming from the these cards people are using in the country they will not be able to use it the crucial utility supply ban so usually the countries are using some utilities everyone is not having everything so they are importing something so if those if they are aware that these are a specific thing which is needed for your country and you don't have the stock and they will stop the supply definitely this will create the problem for the country export so every country is doing export so if there is an export ban that is also again a financial loss to a country so if you will see if you will see the pattern most of the time they are creating the even either unrest or financial bans so the country have to obey the rules another thing is degrading the status so every country maintain the status with other country so some are having the golden status uh, for example the x countries civilians can visit Y country without any visa or visa on arrival will be given or they can uh, invest in their property and they will give a longer period of visa or they will give the citizenship or they will have some privileges those status can be degraded and that will also create a financial problem for the specific country when we go about uh, stock market this is having a different behavior if any two countries go into the war, this will go down or it may crash also. So whenever any unrest or any war happens, the stock market crashes immediately, specifically for that country. Various banks, uh, various ban on the central bank. So every country has the central bank and central bank has certain assets and certain transactions various kind of ban could be imposed on the central bank and then the central bank will not be able to function the freely gps system ban so if the country doesn't have their own gps system so gps system ban can create a very big problem for the country because they will not be able to navigate to the x and y coordinates where they actually want to reach. Ban to the technology. So every country is using some kind of technology, some kind of hardware, some kind of software, encryption, semiconductors. If their supply is broken, then the country cannot run their servers, their systems, their securities for a longer period. So this ban is also uh, creates a lots of problem for the system. If we will talk about the social media, social media ban can also create the unrest or social media can be used as a weapon to change the behavior or to change the interpretation of the public. Search engine ban, so search engine people are using some global search engines. Those search engine can be banned into a specific reason. And these are some sanctions if the list is very long, if I, have, if I will talk about few more. So ban on defense equipments. So every defense needs some equipments which they do not produce. So if the defense equipments are having the ban, then again, it will create a problem for the country itself. The insurance ban, internet ban, freezing the central bank assets and transactions, airspace not allowing the country to use the airspace, various financial bans that supporting the weak partners. Suppose in war, some weak partners are supporting so you can put sanctions on them so they will just uh, they will not support further so and airline ban these kind of some sanctions are there which public has seen till now in various countries uh, dispute but yeah this is what is the sanction now we will go into the 
cyber war and cyber warfare. First, we will understand the difference. What is the difference between cyber war and cyber warfare? So cyber warfare is the procedure or a mechanism or a tactics to do the cyber war. And cyber war is, is actually an action. So when you are taking the action is the cyber war. And what enables it, that is the cyber warfare. Let's talk about cyber warfare. Cyber warfare is the use of digital attacks against the enemy state, causing the comparable harm to use warfare or disturbing their vital computer systems. So when I am talking about vital computer systems, I am talking about their servers, not the local laptops. So, but yes, it covers the local PCs as well. But the major target will be the essential vital computer systems. So cyber warfare usually define a cyber attack or series of cyber attacks on the target country. So if we will talk about the type of cyber warfares, so one is espionage. In this, uh, it's a kind of a spine. So if you will talk about traditional espionage, it's not, it, it, it is not like it will happen in the war time only. It happens before war, after war, the major powers keep on doing the spying on each other. But when we talk about cyber espionage, this is truth. This happens, always happens. This has various ways to do it and people are doing. The next warfare is sabotage. What is sabotage? Sabotage is deliberately destroying, damaging or creating the obstacles, especially for political or military advantage. What can be stopped? Anything, anything. That could be a power, that could be a water, that could be a fuel, that could be a communication, that could be a transportation, that could be an infrastructure. That all may be vulnerable for the disruption if proper cyber security mechanisms are not used. It includes the public spaces as well, could be a stolen card numbers, could be a potential target, including the electric power grids, trains, stock markets. So there are various things and list is not a small. Wherever we are talking about the list is not a small, it can go further, further, further. It depends on how much vulnerability you have in your system. The next cyber warfare is denial of service attack. So denial of service attack happens either from one source or it could be distributed. So usually we call it as a DDoS, distributed denial of service attack that attempts to make a machine or network unavailable to its intended users. For example, suppose thousands of systems will directly start sending lots of data to one specific server and they will collapse its complete bandwidth. Then system will not be available for the target users. So this unavailability, this outage of service can be used for their specific mission for that they are doing it. The another uh, way to do the outage is cutting the undersea communication cable may severely cripple some regions and countries in regards to information warfare ability. So once they are, there are certain reasons if their undersea water cable is cut, that's the, that's all. They are no more having the connectivity. Now the electric power grid. So electric power grid is very important system and it's a backbone for the country. Same like as any other things like telecommunication or any other services. The cybersecurity experts admits that the electronic power grid is susceptible to cyber warfare because any power grid these days, they all are automated. They are using the services. They are using the internet, they are using the applications and when they are using the cyber related things, then they are definitely can be having the vulnerabilities. Cyber warfare attack can do massive power outage and that may create a national trauma. It directly hits the country's backbone. Disconnecting the electricity will put the country 50 years old condition and that could be the advantage for the the next type of cyber warfare is propaganda. Propaganda creates a very vital role in cyber warfare because it sets the narrative of the public. So cyber propaganda is an effort to control the information in whatever form it takes and influence public opinion. So 
maybe i am thinking something but i will see 10 other guys opinion and i will change my opinion and this is what propaganda is those all 10 people who are telling me something via in some digital form if they are part of that propaganda that may have changed my opinion it may start with civil unrest and it could cause it could be used as a weapon with a little financial and ideological flavor it could cause a grave damage to national security and country may have to be a enemy army as well as civil protest at the same time so you can understand how much it can cause the damage what can make it successful social media social media fake side news social influencers media houses play good role in this next cyber warfare is economic disruption for this people use the ransomware because they will encrypt the data and they will create the unavailability as well as they get the access to the data as well so we have seen some examples earlier wanna cry pataya this kind of some cyber attacks we have seen and these attacks has created lots of disruption into the internet services in certain regions these attacks are categorized as the cyber crime specifically a financial crime because they negatively affect the company or group or country's economy cyber warfare attack and cyber 911 as name says it is going to do multiple cyber attacks at the same time so it will disrupt the services immediately so if i will talk about the example again the list is endless but for some example knocking out the basic services like power outages your banking services your change in your financial data so you will not have the correct reportings what you have as finance so you will may end up with the wrong decisions attack on data integrity disgruntled sewage system disrupted water supply so list is endless anything so it is a surprise cyber attack which can immediately will happen and it will create lots of services down at the same time or it will modify the data or it will change the data in a way that they want so you will have the wrong decision making and you will have the outages other cyber war attacks are wiping the data from the computer systems especially from vital computer systems data breaches stealing the data and getting that data creating the information and understanding your strategies next one is identity theft identity theft could be your fingerprint could be your iris could be your normal identity which is you are carrying as that that identify who you are the attack may come on the data which is national identity management program servers and they can steal this data and this can create the grave damage to their country because this has each and every users biometric data as well as the the, the information so if suppose you are using a token and token is compromised you can replace that token but suppose you are using the fingerprint or iris and that is compromised you cannot cut the finger right you cannot poke the eye right you don't have the second iris so this is once compromised always compromised so the disadvantage of the biometric system today you have learned taking the control over the powerful servers and triggering the attack inside the country or outside the country with those servers disrupting the radars communications networks it can include blocking the signals remote destroying the computers circuits spoofing the gps systems and disturbing the navigations so suppose one troop is going to a x y coordinate and you have spoofed the gps system instead of reaching to the x y position if they will reach some other position where you already have trap for them so you can understand the example could be silly but you understood the point right who triggers the cyber war so there are five categories i have created first state sponsored hackers so that could be the cyber war could be for three reasons one defensive cyber operations second cyber espionage operations third offensive cyber operations so there could be three reasons due to that state sponsored hackers could be available in any specific state hacktivists these hacktivists are group of the criminals who unite 
to carry out the cyber attacks in support of political causes. So they don't need even the payment. They are having their own agendas and they are very, very, very serious because they are the group of the people and they are seriously can create the damage to the cyber security. Black hat hackers. So these are paid or unpaid, but the black hat hackers for the malicious intent, they can be used for the hacking. Nationalist groups which are working into the cyber security domain and military operated operations. So these are the five categories which can trigger the cyber war or it can be used in the cyber war. So what are the major business entities which are lucrative for the attackers to attack? So very first we have to understand why systems get compromised. The reason one, we are doing something which we should not do. Reason two, we are not doing something which we should do. So what is the example of what we should not do and we are doing that? That is the client compromise. If there are something which we should not do and we are doing that, our client systems will get compromised. But servers gets compromised when we should do something and we are not doing that. Suppose you need a X, Y security and you are not doing that, you will get compromised definitely because it will be a vulnerability in your system. So I will, so I'm going to call out the list of those organizations which are usually on the target of the enemies. So one is the national identity management program. So this is the program which is having each and everyone's identity and they are always on the target. Ministry of External Affairs, Ministry of Home Affairs, National Security Advisors and their accounts, Defense Research and Development Organizations could be in every country has different different organizations. Intelligence and security services, that is also every country has their own intelligence services and they are always on the target of the cyber criminals. Military, police and border security forces, nuclear power plants because this may create grave damage to their country if they are compromised. Energy plants, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Finance, the banking system, Department of Information Technology, National Computer Emergency Response Team. So usually when this kind of attack happens, the National Computer Emergency Response Team revert to the attack, but if they all compromise, then they will not be able to uh, help the businesses, whether it is a government operated or the private sector. News and radio system, that is again plays the vital role in the country. Communication and GPS system, including the internet providers, hospitals, hotels, insurance companies, and list goes on. There is no end of this list. But these are some vital areas where they are lucrative business for attackers. How to combat cyber warfare? So the one solution is conducting risk assessment with cyber war games. The best way to assess the national's readiness for cyber warfare is to conduct the real life exercise or simulations, also known as cyber war games. A war game can test how government and private organizations will respond to a cyber warfare scenario. It exposes the gap in the defiance. It improves the coordination between the entities. Most importantly, the war game can help defenders to learn how quickly to act and what need to be done to come out of this attack. It can save the or it can protect the critical infrastructure and it can save the lives as well. Cyber warfare game is a red team and blue team exercise, but at a different level. If we talk about in a company, it is at a company level. But when we talk about cyber warfare and cyber war games, it is between the multiple organization and departments where because for cyber security, you need lots of people to support. So we can test the different solutions. Detecting the attacks in early stages is very crucial and mitigating the risk before or after critical infrastructure compromise. That is also required. So usually companies has the security tools which are talking about the mitigation before the compromise. But the team should be also ready after the compromise so they can immediately take the action. They should be having their SOPs, their plans, their procedures that what need to be done if system is compromised. Testing unusual scenarios. So you need to think about unusual scenarios which are unusual for you because attacks are never conducted by a book. 
सो वॉट यू थिंक्स इज विल बी नेवर हैपन दैट विल हैपन इन द साइबर वॉर बाई एस्टेब्लिशिंग अ रेड टीम दैट एक्ट एज अ अटैकर एंड ट्राइज टू फाइंड द क्रिएटिव वेज टू ब्रीच द टारगेट सिस्टम द डिफेंडर कैन ऑल्सो लर्न हाउ टू मिटिकेट द रियल सिनेरियोज डिविजन ऑफ लेबर एंड कॉपरेशन मैकेनिज्म साइबर वॉरफेयर रिक्वायर मेनी इंडिविजुअल डिपार्टमेंट्स ऑर्गेनाइजेशन गवर्नमेंट यूनिट्स टू कम टूगेदर कॉलोबरेट एंड फाइट टूगेदर सो अ साइबर वॉर गेम कैन ब्रिंग टूगेदर दोज पीपल्स हु मे नॉट नो ईच अदर हु मे नॉट हैव द कॉन्टेक्ट ऑफ ईच अदर एंड हेल्प दैम टू डिसाइड हाउ टू वर्क टूगेदर इन द इवेंट ऑफ क्राइसिस इंप्रूविंग द पॉलिसीज दिस इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट if you do not have the administrative policies if you do not have the cyber security national framework definitely it will create a problem because you will not have a uniform security in your country governments may establish cyber warfare policies but need to be test them in practical so it should not be just a theory paper it should be tested in the practical companies should have red and blue team government should also do the collaborative efforts to test it sometimes when you will go into the practical you will learn that what is missed the another point is layer defense which is also known as onion defense because it has layer and layer and layer you will have network security perimeter security you will have the tunnelings you will have data security identity management encryption you will have sim solutions n number of security tools you will create you will create policies you will create processors you will create n number of layers so if the one layer is broken you will at least have the second layer which will protect you so when they work together they creates a defense which is known as the layer defense so under the pressure of cyber warfare governments of many countries have issued the operational national security policies to protect their information and infrastructure these policies typically use the layer defense approach which includes securing the cyber ecosystems raising the awareness about the cyber security promoting the open standards for combating cyber threats implementing a national security assurance framework working with private organizations to improve their cyber security capabilities so how to secure private sectors so usually if you have seen the countries has created national security policies and they will do the audits so to ensure that the everyone is having the right defense in the security so some points are given below the strategic factors in cyber warfare is resilience of local business to cyber attacks the businesses need to tighten their security measures to reduce the benefit of the attack on the national state create the obstacles to breaching the network so layer defense could be the good example which can help to create the obstacles to breaching the network the web application firewall so usually people talk about firewall this is the layer 7 firewall so you can use wolf which can quickly detect investigate and block the malicious traffic quickly respond to the breach restore the business operations facilitate cooperations between public and private sectors that is very very much required use local white hat hackers as a resource to help to protect against your foreign cyber threats cyber warfare protection so how to protect from cyber warfare if you will ask me i will put highest priority to identity and access management program because you may have layer and layer of defenses you may have x y number of tools but what if the identity is compromised if your digital identity is compromised you can have n number of defense but that is not going to help you because they will directly bypass they will use the credential they will come inside the organization and from there they will launch the attack and once they are inside the organization your all the security is bypassed so what is needed to have a proper identity management in the country in the organizations in the public sector in the private sector the very first thing is identity proofing so the identity which is getting authenticated and authorized they need to prove themselves with different authentication schemes so we will discuss this different authentication schemes in a while the next point is identity management 
So the identity should be managed via authorized source. If it is a public entity, then there should be an authorized authority which will manage the each and every citizen's identity. If it is a private company, then HR system could be a best example for the source of the identity. Multi-factor authentications. So multi-factor authentications are very, very much required to authenticate one user. Suppose you are having a biometric system or you are having a password system or you are having a PIN system. These three systems has their own pros and their own cons. If you are using a single system, definitely there is a chance to compromise. But when you will add more than one or more than two systems in a series and you create an authentication scheme, that is called as multi-factor authentication. This scheme should be always sequential. This cannot be parallel. That either you want to use password, either you want to use uh, biometric or either you want to use uh, PIN. Either anything you will use, you will authenticate. This is not a multi-factor authentication. The multi-factor authentication should be sequential. First, you will authenticate against password. Then you will authenticate against second factor. That could be a biometric, that could be a PIN, that could be something else. In multi-factor authentication, we should not have same type of authentication scheme at both the level. Suppose the level one is password, the level two is password. Then if the first is broken, second is also broken. So we should have two different type of mechanism to authenticate the user. Privileged account management. In privileged account management, your day-to-day -day identity and your privileged identity should be separated. Your privileged identity should have a specific time to escalate their privileges, sorry, to elevate their privileges, go and do their work, what is needed, and again come back. So the privileged account management is much, much, much required in, to manage the identity management. The next thing is web application firewall. As I have already explained, it's a layer, layer 7 uh, firewall. Encryption. So even if your data is in REST or data is in wire or data is in use, the encryption need to be used. So even if the data is stolen, at least it should not be in the plain text. And if our, if our encryption is strong, it will take them maybe hundreds or thousands of years to decrypt it. So there is no encryption which cannot be decrypted. It can be decrypted, but the, the system is if there is an encrypted data and it will take attacker 100 years to decrypt it, the purpose is solved. Then after 100 years, that data is no more productive, no more useful. Patching. Patching creates a very vital role in the cybersecurity because every system need patches after a certain time, especially security patches, because they will have the security vulnerabilities. So if we will not patch the system, the system, there is a higher chance to get compromised. VPNs. VPNs protect the privacy as well as the identity. And it also creates the tunnel between the client and the server. So the communication is secure. API security. When we are talking about this world, it is completely integrated world, which are integrated with the APIs. In whatsoever form, you, you might be using the direct or indirect, but you are using APIs behind your screen, uh, behind your UIs. So you need to secure them. There are various ways to secure it, but the, like, the topic will become uh, very big if I will go there as well. So runtime application self-protection. This is much required. Each and every application should have their own security mechanism as well. We should not only rely on security systems. So when we are onboarding any application, we should see their cyber security capabilities as well. Advanced bot protection, DDoS protection, attack analytics. These topics I have, I think, already covered. Client side protection. Client side protections, there are multiple tools are there, DLP, antivirus, anti-malware. So these systems are there which you can use. Database security, cloud data security, and data risk analysis. So these are the some points, uh, but the list always, because it's a cyber security, it is a very dynamic field, always things grow, come, uh, the new kind of attack comes, the new kind of security comes. So it keep on updating. And again, the tools are endless, but you need a layered defense to protect, to defense against 
साइबर वॉरफेयर थैंक्स गाइज वी आर क्लोजिंग टूडेज टॉपिक बाय होप यू हैव लाइक दिस इफ यू हैव लाइक दिस प्लीज शेयर सब्सक्राइब एंड लाइक माई चैनल बाय